there, there, there's no gain saying that there are kidnappings and issues surrounding kidnappings, whether it's expats in the field, regular civilians, um, you know, like the girls who were kidnapped, the boys who were kidnapped in their school, um, people looking for ransom money just because of hardship, economic hardship and corruption. Um, there are issues like that that are prevalent in, you know, just the dynamics, the socioeconomic dynamics, um, you know, in Nigeria and surrounding areas. And, you know, the writer, I believe, thought to, first of all, it started, the inspiration for the film kind of started to do something contained, you know, something that we could get them relatively quickly. Um, he was really re yearning to write a story and get it produced because the last uh, work that we had done was over a decade old. So the whole goal was, you know, how quickly can we get this done? So it was a contained story, you know, eight people in a room. Um, how do we keep them in the room? What do, what do they talk about? What's the dynamic, the human condition when you're trapped and that kind of a thing. So that was what inspired it really. Um, it started from a creative place. Um, what can we contain? And then let's talk about what issues can we tackle in this kind of contained way. So from there, you know, the business side came in, um, you know, what's going to commercialize it in terms of how would people enjoy it more when we watch it, should we take them out of the room and vice versa and all that kind of stuff. So we put it in and then, you know, there's the topic at the time that was really um, all about those kidnappings that have been happening around the nation and surrounding areas like, this is a very thought provoking topic. This is a very, um, very disturbing um, issue that has been going on for over a decade in the country. You know, why is it happening? Why are people looking for ransom money? Why can't people just go home and be safe? You know, it got so bad at some point there were curfews in certain areas. And we just thought, you know, he just thought, the writer thought, you know, that was something that we could in infuse in the story and t talk about it, not just in a room with people in there, but basically take it outside of the room and deal with the issues. How do they interact with the outside world after that? How do you deal with these kinds of issues? So that's kind of where it started from. As with everything, sometimes it starts creatively. Sometimes it starts with like, you know, I really want to make something. What can I make right now? It wasn't like this, an incident occurred and we're like, oh yeah, we're going to make a, a movie out of it. Not necessarily. It started from a creative place and yearning that one tell a story. And then he came up with, you know, that is the most contained thing that he could tell at that time. It's very interesting that it happened because I was at the American Film Market in LA when this whole thing happened. So, um, so the director had put it into Africa. So, Africa is the largest film festival in Africa. It is the biggest, and it was at this festival that Black Panther: What Kind of Forever premiered in Africa, where they were trying to really do the Renaissance day. And you know, the director said, "Okay, you know what? I, I'm, we're, we've put it. We're in the festival." Um, you know, let's see what goes. So I was out there in LA, we're just all praying and hoping for the best. I was like, wow, if this happens, like this is the biggest festival in Africa. It gives us some momentum to push the film. And a friend called, um, her name is Tracy Etimekta. She just called, she's like, oh my God, Chibi, you guys won. Because I didn't watch it in real time. She's like, you won the, the, the biggest award. You won the biggest award. I was like, <laughs> so I was like, thank you so much, because I was just so in a day that I was at the conference days and I was really busy there working. So it was such a relief. It was kind of like all of these years of just toiling, raising funds, because the film was self-funded. Um, there was no big um, institution or any, and just certain people who believed in it that, that funded it. Um, and it was just like, this is paying off. This is something because the film had issues going down the line. Like there were a lot of corrections we had to make in it. Um, it took a while. There, there is just a lot of things like you go through this whole process, painful process of making the film. Um, you go back and make corrections. The director went back and made a lot of, changed a few things, a lot of things, made, made a lot of stuff in Nigeria because we're shot in location. And, you know, kudos to him, that all paid off and paid off for the entire team. So, of course, I was very elated when I heard about it. I was like, yes, at the festival where Black Panther premiered, I can say that now. Not only did it win the best feature film, it also won the best screenplay, and it also won the best actor, a young man by the name of Daniel Etimiafiong, and uh, he's an amazing actor in Nigeria, and is doing some really big things. So, um, 
he just stayed up for the entire team. A lot of congratulatory messages coming through and uh, a lot of stuff in the press just saying that, you know, the film had one big at the festival. And I recently met the founder of the festival at Cannes. So we were on a panel together at Cannes Film Festival and she just called me aside, you know, and she said, oh, hey, look, just so you know, the people that were on the board that selected the film, they're not even locals. So it kind of resonated above and beyond the outside of the area that we thought it was just over Nigerians or Africans who would relate to it. They weren't even from there. So it kind of made me feel like, wow, this is some sort of validation that the film can travel and resonate with certain other people that were not necessarily just local. So, you know, it pays off, it paid off. And uh, yeah, it's just joy. <laughs> Yes. So the name of, so Kofa means the door. The door is a name that it, it's based on the fact that it was kind of like a door and a vault between the outside world and the room where these people were trapped in. So, um, the door is, so in the story, there are eight people in a room. They wake up, they don't have any memories. They don't have their phones. They're just in their underwear and they're trying to remember how they got into the room. And while they're trying to remember that and uh you know wonder who and who amongst them knows what what was going on or how they ended up there there's a man that keeps coming into the room he's played by the actor called udoka oyeka he comes into the room and he's taking them out one after the other so he comes into the room and then the door opens he comes in so the door opens and the light from the outside world floods it and he takes one of them out and the door shuts again and they're trapped in their memory loss, they're trapped in contemplation, they're trapped in accusations and betrayals and how do we get out of here and try to figure out what's each person's greatest skill set that they can use. And every time this man came back into the room, he's bloodied and they're scared for their lives. So that door is a sort of a, when you're trapped in the room, the metaphor between it and the vault, so the, the opening to the outside world. And Kofa is the house that word for the door. And, you know, we thought that it made sense to give it, you know, um, more um, because I was just like the door, the door, you know, we're a Nigerian story. We're trying to get the story to the rest of the world. I think we should give it something that's the, that has a little bit more kick to it. So I literally opened the house of dictionary and I was just looking like, what does it mean of the door and how and it's Kofa. I was like, oh, there you go. Four letter word, easy to remember. Let's go with Kofa. And, you know, um, the team was agreeable to that. And that's how the name came about. Let's start with the similarities. Similarities is, you know, it's the eagerness to tell stories that would entertain, educate, and, and influence pop culture, hopefully on both ends. And, um, but the difference is very, very tremendous. First of all, Nollywood really turns out a lot of movies. And Nollywood came from a place of pure desire to tell stories. And what is known as Nollywood today really started with the home video culture. So Nigeria has always had a film culture. They, they took time to produce really good quality films, you know, back in the day, back in the 70s, 80s, like, and they had a cinema culture of some sort. However, in the early 90s, they were businessmen who are basically trying to make money and they know that people love stories. If you know anything about African culture, it's all about storytelling, folklore, you know, drama, comedy. We love this stuff. So they, in, in I think, not just from a creative place, but from a business place, because there were business people who started it. And the very first films, one of the very first films is called Living in Bondage. Now, Living in Bondage is a story and then they used to call it home video because the production value wasn't quite there. It, you could see it was just pure passion to tell a story. So all these stories about cultural stuff, a man who hurts his wife, what happens to him, blah, 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 and go on and, and so forth. Other people saw that the model was working. It was a business model. And, and funny enough, back in the day, those stories used to be spoken in Igbo. Igbo is a language spoken in Southeastern Nigeria. And they used to subtitle it to English. Sometimes they wouldn't even subtitle it. And before you knew it, so many other, um, there was the Yoruba language, there were other languages. And before you knew it, it just became this culture of, wow, we have these stars. People know these people. Okay, they have star power. So if you put them in this other biz in this other story, people would want to watch it. So it became a business model that worked. And um, it came from a place of tenacity. We always do so much with so little. And before you knew it, a lot of people were making home videos. So it came from that. Now, fast forward to another 20 years, 
you have a lot of people who are coming from the diaspora um, making um, films that had a little bit more, you know, so much more time spent in the story, more time spent in the production quality, production value. They were no longer just home videos. They were early ones. Funnily enough, one of the films that, you know, I made with uh, the the gentleman who made this same Copa, uh, Jude, was called The Tenant, and that film was made back in 2008. So it's one of the films that it actually premiered with Avatar back in 2008 in Nigeria. So those are when slowly we started getting higher quality films, people from the diaspora, and then people locally obviously were challenged and they started making more and more. So now you have Nigerian and Nollywood stories, Nollywood films being streamed on global platforms like Netflix. You know, I could sit here in Toronto and watch something that was totally made in Nigeria and just not look at home video. You could see the effort that was put into the production. You know, I recently watched Gangs of Lagos. I watched Shantytown. These are brilliant films that, you know, the stories are getting so much better. The production effort and value is there. Um, the difference is the journey between Hollywood and Hollywood, the journey. And I think it's, it, you know, you you it, you can't really put both of them um, in the same comparison or say apples to oranges because they literally came from different places, different roots, different parents, different desires, different business models, completely different. And again, economically, you know, Hollywood has tremendous resources that, that Nollywood doesn't have, yet it's able to compete globally as being the third largest from producing um, uh, industry in the world. So we've come a really long way and our stories are getting better. There's a lot more work to be done for sure, but we're getting to the point where very soon you start seeing us on, um, you know, the Oscar stage representing. We already have our music artists representing, you know, being nominated for Oscars, for putting their music work in Oscars. Thames is one that comes to mind. And it's amazing to see that. And very soon the film will pick up. It's just that film is a lot slower in process. You know, you got to develop the story, you got to find funding. And when you're done all of that, you have to shoot. You have to have your script, a shooting script. You have to bring the team together. And then you start editing it. Then you start working around distribution. And then you go to festivals. And then you start, before you get any of those kind of recognition or invitation for the Oscars or Globe, uh, Golden Globes or bigger Emmys, or bigger award platforms like that, the award looked at as validation for you to have arrived. But I think Nollywood is coming a real long way. And we are tenacious, brilliant, industrious, and uh, really fighting to finish. And we'll come to a place where it's not about competing or comparing us with Hollywood necessarily, but looking at each one for what they really are, for what they really stand for. You know, Nigerians love comedy. We love drama. That's what it is. But every time I go to conferences and festivals, you hear them say, oh, the drama genre is so difficult to sell. I'm like, speak for yourself. Like, it's hot cake in Nigeria. And people in the Caribbean. People in South America, they love drama. It, it, it sells, especially for stories that they can relate to. So Nollywood is here to stay. It's growing tremendously. And I think it's just going to come to the point where it becomes ubiquitous. And that's what we're all fighting for. So I would know more when it actually starts streaming because it hasn't started streaming, but I believe that it will be relatable. It's the relatability of the story that really allows it to resonate in any type of way. First things first, there is this way that the people in the Caribbean, the people outside of Nigeria, and I always go back to Caribbean South America because they're the closest to us based on colonialism and the uh, transatlantic slave trade. However, I feel that when they see it, every time they watch our films, they watch uh, Nollywood films, even the whole videos, they're like, oh, I recognize this. I, I resonate with this. I resonate with that. It's kind of like myself, you know, the very first time that I visited Jamaica, I realized how similar we are, you know, from even the items that are sold on the shelves. You know, I could see the, the leftovers of colonialism in the two different countries. And, you know, sometimes it takes you leaving your country of origin to really um, appreciate where you're coming from and what it means to be you culturally. So I think a part of us is in the story. And because a part of us is in the story, people in the Caribbean, people in South America, people outside, people in Europe, hopefully, that has been a goal of mine. <laughs> and I'll come back to that later. But 
the, the whole thing is I, I believe that it's the human experience. All of us feel trapped sometimes in some type of way. And the story really talks about that entrapment in some way and, and the battle to come out of it and what it means to be out of it and what it means to go further even after being out of it. So I think, you know, it could even be an emotional entrapment. It could be being trapped in a career that you don't like. It could be being trapped in a relationship you don't like. It could be being trapped in a business that you don't like. Um, all these kinds of traps and mental, um, just just be feeling trapped for lack of a better term. We all experience it in one way or another. And I think it is a universal story. It's a universal feeling. It's something you can relate to. You know, when a loved one is, is not is taken away and you're being asked for ransom for them, you're worried about their, their well-being, you're worried about are you gonna get them in one piece? It's real and it's real for everyone. So I think like from that perspective, hopefully the rest of the world can relate and it can resonate with them just from the human ex central human experience of um, being trapped and the fight to get out of being trapped. For me, it, it really is from a resource perspective and an opportunity uh, perspective. So um, I think it was at Content London last year that I asked the question at a panel that Universal Studios was at. And I said, what will it take? Because every time, you know, we've seen the woman king. It's an African story, it's this, it's that, but you know, it's not in Hollywood. It's not um, any other, it's not even South African. Like it's shot on location, but the people who bring the ingredient are really not from the, are, are not based on the continent. They're not nurtured necessarily from the continent. It's a story that Hollywood loves wants to tell and kudos to them for telling because guess what if you're not telling your story somebody else is going to pick up a pen and tell it so you better hurry up and show why you're the right person to tell that story i think first of all is respecting the source of where a story comes from respecting the people enough to know that they're in the best position to give the best perspectives to these stories it's kind of like what's happening in corporate you know america and canada and europe and the rest of the world we're talking a lot about diversity and inclusion and that's because guess what a diverse team does so much better it's been proven time and time and time again they do so much better than a mono uh, uh, a monolith of, of a team so you find um hollywood you know, run off and create people. I mean, I'm not saying they don't involve Africans necessarily, but if we're talking about an industry in Hollywood, how can Hollywood court it? How can Hollywood, it's not, I don't even know if it's necessarily about courting, but when there's an opportunity to tell a story that's from a certain place that you're, you're boring, like a Benin story, which is Woman King, or like another story from a certain place, how about, how do you get the locals involved? when you're shooting? How do you get the locals involved when you're writing? So that we're seeing the, the locals who grew up in these societies, who know about these societies, be part of the people who write it. He who writes history is the person who has the power, basically. So if somebody's out there writing your history, it's anything you get, you know, and you run with it. We were very, oh, everybody was happy when Black Panther came out. And then later people started poking holes and saying, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Same with Woman King. There are a lot of Africans that saw it and said, people in Benin were happy about it. I met a producer from Benin just at Cannes recently. And he was very, he was saying that they had a different perspective about it, but he, they needed more of the people, the, the, be all, the, the decision makers in Hollywood to come closer to the people at the grassroots making these decisions when they're making these decisions. So I think from an Hollywood thing, first of all, getting our talents shown in bigger budget productions, nurturing them to get to the point where if it's from a commercial perspective, I as a producer, I understand it because I'm from the business side of things as well as the creative, but you have to nurture those talents. Tom Cruise didn't become Tom Cruise overnight, right? So he was nurtured over time and then became the big star he is. There are others in Africa who can be given a chance. I watch Blood and Water, magnificent acting, magnificent characters that are there. Great job for all of them. Look at Lupita Yago. Lupita was doing productions in Kenya. Um, productions, uh, I think it was called uh, something, uh, uh, an African production that we all, I, the name just eludes me right now, but. She started from there and they gave her an opportunity in 12 years as slave and she killed it. And it was after that opportunity that 
Lupita, everybody knows Lupita now. And we can see how you can put her in blockbusters. That's one. That's an anomaly. That's an outlier. That's not the story of all of the Africans. But what about we merge? What about Africans who are, who speak for Nigerians, who are in Nollywood, collaborate with other African Americans in Hollywood, create a big production? I see uh, Mora Budu, who uh, um, founder of, of uh, Ebony Life uh, Studios, he's recently signed a deal with Idris Elba so they can create productions. And we want to see more of that. And not just that you say an individual, right? But these studios, we want the backing of the big studios. If a big studio came and said, we want to invest, we want to put in more screens, we want to put in more eyeballs on screens in our cinemas, because we can't compete when it comes to cinemas, the number of cinemas we have. We can start from there. We can start from nurturing artists, giving them opportunities, giving our producers opportunities to line produce locally, giving us opportunities to also do exchange where we produce in the US as well and give them perspectives from an African. So you have to take a little from each perspective when, and on a case by case basis where it works and give people opportunities to shine and nurturing and mentoring them. I think that's where we come from. But ever and before then, I think a few people can rise up in Hollywood. A few people in the African-American Hollywood can rise up and decide, okay, let's put in our, our money where our mouth is and come up with a great production. That's a great story, well told. It doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles, but a very well told story. And you can see where how far it can go. And I think we can start from there. A story comes to mind, women talking. It won the Oscar for best um, adaptation. Very simple story. I could count how many locations, but it was brilliantly told. Simple little things like that. And then you have that collaboration going. I would say, because right now I'm actually researching an area in the south, south of Nigeria, where there's a lot of oil spills, a lot of poverty, even though they are the region where they're the oil generating region. So oil is a natural resource in Nigeria. But imagine that you are you come from an, an area or region where you produce this oil in tremendous amounts, but you're impoverished. Um, it's it's kind of like a fish who's in the water and doesn't have water to drink. It's, it's just ridiculous. So for me, that's a serious issue because when there was the BP, BP oil spills some years ago, the whole world didn't hear the end of it. It was in the news, it was talked about, oh, it's coming to the coast of Florida, all these problems. Are you saying the people in Florida and area are better than these people in the south, south part of Nigeria? Why is it not making news? Why is Shell there? Like, why do we have all these issues with all these oil companies and the spills going on and there's no, and people are going because they're not necessarily educated. They're trying to get oil and there's explosions. People are losing their loved ones. People are dying. There's, you can't farm because the soil is just, it's just compromised. And I think that's a serious issue that I would like to bring to the forefront. And these are part of the things where he who is producing should get some of the stuff back into the country. Recently, we handed over power in Nigeria and the fuel subsidy got removed. And the fuel subsidy, you know, it's not, it's honestly the, the rich that have been benefiting from it because honestly the poor, they're, they're not the ones who are driving cars. They're not the ones who are running the big gems and stuff like that when you really think about it. And that's just, but when the fuel subsidy goes away, everybody suffers, especially the poor, because you go to the mountain, uh, the markets, you go to shop for groceries and everything will double the price. It's these kinds of issues. Why do we have a subsidy in that sense? Why are we exporting our gas to these other areas for them to only bring it back in, in, into the country? Another issue that's very close to dear to my heart is the after effects of colonialism. Um, I'm currently working on a project. It's an African futuristic sci-fi drama. It's a TV series. And it is really about um, what happens when the imperialists and colonialists want to come back to Africa again? Call the third coming. And again, when I say when they're coming back again in this day and age, what happens when they're when, when they come back? And I want to talk about the sports because, like I said, when I visited uh, South America, when I visited Car the Caribbean, when I visited Cuba recently, I just see it everywhere, and I'm like. I see it in culture, I see it in religion, I see it economically. You know, I see it in so many ways where we owe debt to these countries for years and we're only able to serve as the interest. 
And I'm really passionate about this topic because sometimes we don't even know why we're focusing on so many other things. But these are the things that are hindering us from developing infrastructure on the continent. Because the countries that we borrow from literally can tell you what you can use those funds for. And because you're paying them interest, you really don't have a voice. So if we can come together and really tackle colonialism from an intellectual point of view and explain to the people and let the people understand what is really going on and how can we really be proud of our culture. You can't be say you're proud of the culture when you're borrowing from another culture and owning it more than you own your own culture. You just can't. You're always going to see through the lenses of that culture. So for me, it's a big uh, question mark and I am exploring that topic in my next uh, uh, project. Everything really is about the future. Sometimes when people talk about futuristic, they already think of a dystopia. They think of that's not how it, it, it rings in my head. For me, it's the future. What is happening next? How do you in, in, influence it? How do you impact it? Um, I really appreciate where Africa is going. There's a renaissance happening. People love it. However, I'm like, hang on a second. You love everything that's coming from Africa, but are the people benefiting economically? What does that mean for us? So for me, Afrofuturism, African futurism is really about when we're moving forward towards the future, be it technologically, socially, culturally, culturally is a big one that's happening now. What does that mean for us? How are we evolving? What could we become? without too much interference from the outside, from us really owning our culture. And I just mentioned about that recently. What does that look like? So for me, that's really where the inspiration for African futurism comes in. And then Afrofuturism, of course, because that is anything in the diaspora is Afrofuturism. But if it's rooted and coming from Africa, then I look at it as African futurism. And that came from a writer. I think her name is Nnedi Okorafo. So yeah. Um, like I said, I'm researching for a documentary uh, to work on to, that I'm going to be working on and I'm leaning towards the South South, you know, there's women's issue. I really want to, the vision of Cole Studios is to center the African experience on the world stage. So my goal and what people will be seeing from me is stories that are linked to Africa. I want to bring those to the forefront. I want people to understand the African experience is a human experience. We're not removed from the rest of the world. We experience things the way you want things working in your country, the way you turn on your lights, whatever you want, price your clothes, whatever you want. We want those things too. We want education. We want a, a, a functioning government. And I want to bring those uh, issues into the center stage, but not just issues, but celebrating our culture, celebrating the impact that we have on the rest of the world and how we continue to impact the world. The so stories that are linked to Africa and the African experience are things that are, I'm passionate about and they're stories that drive what I will be doing going forward. So hopefully people stay tuned and see more of it uh, coming from Cole Studios. Thank you all so much for watching Black News Now. My name is Chibi Louisa Koye, and I am on Instagram as at the Chibi, the Chibi, C H I B I E, and on Twitter, the Chibi, and my website is colostudiosinc.com. So that's C O L O Studios I N C.com. Thank you so much.